Recording will start soon. Seems that Ahmed is talking, but I cannot hear you, Ahmed, unfortunately. I cannot hear you. Your voice is not clear at all. So this is where I believe we stopped, uh, at least for uh, Wednesday's lecture. Um, we know that recording seismic data with the Vipro size poses some challenges because the signal we send with the Vipro size is not uh, a sharp signal. It's non impulsive signal. It has some duration. It's not a sudden signal. So whatever you send, you receive the same signal whenever there is an interface. And since this is a train of signal, a long period of vibrations, we expect to receive a long uh, period of vibrations. So the record, the initial recorded data is not useful. It's in a format that cannot be useful for interpretation or even for processing. And thus we apply a process. The process is basically called correlation. Correlate the sweep we have. So we correlate the sweep, that's the sweep. Right now, the sweep has 10 seconds. We are sending signals in a time span of 10 seconds with a frequency range. It's an upsweep frequency. The frequency is increasing from 6 hertz to 60 hertz. From 6 to 60 hertz. Um, I might ask a question. Do you expect to receive from the ears any frequencies above? 60. Would you expect that? It's not related to the subject. It's just a random question, a geophysical question. The question says, if this is the range of frequencies the sweep contains, would you expect that you recorders or geophone record any signal having a frequency of, for example, 100 hertz? No. It's the same principle. Whatever you send, it's the same thing you receive. So if you want higher resolution data, one thing, one way to achieve higher resolution data is to send for higher, uh, wider range of frequencies is to send basically wider range of frequencies. The range should be wide spectrum. It means the minimum to the maximum frequency is way large. And that's somehow true about uh, a dynamite or about uh, a hammer shot, where it's not true about a viprocise. Viprocise is so controlled that we even can tell what type of frequencies I can I can send to the ground. That's a characteristic of a viprocise that other type of sources lakes basically. It's good somehow. And if you expect that the ETH could not, cannot generate any frequencies or there is no content of frequencies above 60, just send those range of frequencies. Back to the topic. So we have a sweep. The sweep is having a length of 10 seconds. And we got a record. We are listening to the ears for 15 minutes. Oh, sorry, 15 seconds. 15 minutes is too much. So we are recording the data or listening to the ground, waiting for the signals to receive back to be to, to be recorded for 15 minutes and what we initially are recording is almost like a junk it's not of much use direct use so we need to apply a process that process is basically called correlation correlation means find the similarity between two things how similar or dissimilar two things are that's the purpose of what we say 
correlation. If you correlate two things which are exactly the same, you will find that the maximum similarity when they are on top of each other. And two things, if you try to correlate them and they are exactly the same, they will be having the maximum similarity if they are adjacent to each other. No, no lag, no slide. So you can say, oh, this is his uh, uh, eyes. Uh, there are two persons, for example, and they are identical person or twins. You can say, oh, these, their eyes are exactly the same. I can right away compare them. But if they are far away, you might get confused whether they are the same or not. So it's better to, if they are identical, you put them together, you can compare them. It's the same technique, basically, as we were, we were speaking here. So we apply a correlation between the sweep the signal sent by the viprocytes and whatever we recorded through the geophones. And finally, we get a recorded uh, signal uh, or what we call a correlated signal. Uh, in that correlated signal, frankly, we can see some hyperbolas. What hyperbolas are? are reflections, those are reflected or primary energies. And our task is uh, basically later on during data processing is to flatten them and stack them. So that's how um, useful are by precise sources. They are not directly useful, but we do uh, apply a process called correlation. This is a kind of short uh, schematic diagram of showing what kind of energy we could receive from a shot gather. It says that there is a source here and we lie down multiple geophones to either sides of the source. So this, uh, this is your configuration. You are uh, sending an energy and the earth is made up of multiple layers. Uh, the reflected energy would give you the red curves, the red hyperbolas. Those are hyperbolas. The energy directly traveling in the first layer is what we call direct layer. The energy which travels uh, in the after the crossover distance or um, after critical, basically, it appears the first after the crossover distance from the refraction course or refraction uh, chapter. So that's the, the green, green line. This is the, the diffracted energy, assuming that this is the first layer. And this energy you see is called air blast. That's the energy traveling in the air. It's the energy traveling in the air from the source to subsequent geophones. Uh, and if you have, if you got the knowledge how to calculate the velocities, we know that uh, the, the, the velocity and the slope they have a, um, opposite relationships. So, uh, we can easily be basically can calculate the velocity knowing the slope of the line. The reciprocal of the slope gives you the velocity. So we have we can count what is the time, uh, sorry, distance difference and time difference. From distance and time differences, we can calculate easily what is the velocity. And if you calculate the velocity of this line, air blast line, you will come to the conclusion that the velocity is almost close to 300 meter per second. And that's the uh, velocity of sound in air. Then we receive much lower velocity even ground rule. Ground rule is a combination of two types of waves. Those we call surface waves. And we know from our introductory chapters in seismic methods that the surface waves are either Rayleigh wave or love wave. 
Uh, their characteristic is that they are of high amplitudes. Their amplitude is high. Their energy is high. And that's the reason they are destructive during an earthquake. Their velocity is low. They arrive way uh, later, way after than the uh, primary waves, P wave and S waves. And another characteristic they have is that their frequency is low. They have low frequency contents compared to body waves, P wave and S wave. And I gave you some examples. So these are Viper sizes during uh, an acquisition in some deserts. Uh, the, the crew which works in seismic data acquisition, we call it seismic crew. And uh, here we see, for example, many vibrators, they are operating synchronously. They are sending the same dot point. The source is combined as one source. What's the reason? The reason is to increase the signal to noise ratio and increase the impact energy. Let the energy goes much deeper into the ear. Uh, uh, for uh, a seismic data recorded by bioprocesses, the maximum depth of investigation was up until the moho. Moho is basically the boundary between the crust and the mantle. And we know that the moho or the, the crust has a variable thickness. It's uh, from 70 kilometers in the continental crust to 10 to 15 in the oceanic crust. So uh, the seismic, as we know, oh, sorry, or actually the viper sizes, as we already know, they can operate only on land. So the, from the conclusion, we can tell that the depth of investigation from viper sizes was almost 70 kilometers. 70 kilometers is actually very, very deep uh, investigation depth. And as I said uh, last uh, last time with the Tuesday lectures, the operation is really huge. The operation is really big. Those are some geophones lying down. Hundreds or even millions of thousands of geophones. And I highly recommend you go through the link here. It's a, in a video, a video in YouTube. You can watch it yourself. And in terms of display, once we do all the processing, we believe the data are clean. They are right now ready for the geologist, for the geophysicist to interpret. There come a, a lot of variety of uh, display types or display formats. Uh, the simplest format are, are actually three. One of them is called Wiggle Trace. So we can display the original traces they are side by side. Each trace basically is one CDP. Where is my mouse pointer? Okay. So one trace, one specific trace is a combination of many traces before stacking. Once we do stacking, we uh, merge all those traces from the same subsurface point in the in the ground. So uh, each trace is basically uh, originally was multiple tra traces. We combine them through the process of uh, stacking. That's one display. They call it wiggle display. There is another display. The name is variable area. We color shade one side of the trace. So uh, if I give you an example, So let's assume that this is my trace. That's the trace we have. This is zero amplitude. That's the zero amplitude. So what I can do, I can color shade one side from zero to the maximum. So if I remove the line, the zero line, it becomes something like that. So I only shade one side. That's what you call a variable density. So some people, they like usually these types of display. Other people who care too much about the traces, they prefer uh, this type, wiggle, tra wiggle display type. 
Um, we can even go further. We display the data as an image, and that's actually called a variable density. It's called what? A variable density. And whenever you are showing a color or an image, it can have different color scales. Any image, any contour map you show, you can change the color scale. So this, the color scale shown here, is basically called grayscale. It has a range from black to maximum white. Maximum black to maximum white. Uh, that's how the color changes. So maximum black means probably um, peak, and maximum uh, white means trough. That's a peak, this is a trough. So in uh, in simple configuration, let's assume that this is zero. Uh, that's the, the trace. So this color, this area becomes too much dark and the darkness, the opacity will change according how, how much is the amplitude. It becomes too much darker here. It gets a bit whiter, whiter as we go down. It becomes completely white in the bottom. So that's what you see. So the color here, whether, if, whether it's too black or too white, indicate how strong is the reflector. And when I say how strong is the reflector, I mean that what is, or how big is the velocity contrast, or I can tell uh, acoustic impedance difference between the layers. We can, um, we will soon uh, see what exactly is the acoustic impedance. So this is one type of display. They call it variable density, and you can show uh, different types of colors. Here I'm showing a different color scale. It's also a variable density color. By the way, you can stop me whenever you uh, you feel that there is anything um, not clear. So what is a reflector? That's something also I clarified, but I couldn't uh, cover it on Wednesday, so I'm repeating myself again. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the energy might all get reflected. We, in that instant, we can say 100% of the energy have been reflected. Not, nothing got transmitted to deeper layers. And we can materialize that into an equation. So we can write an equation. The equation is uh, a reflecting what we call reflection coefficients. And it's a ratio of how much energy reflected to the how much energy got transmitted. How much energy got reflected back to the surface uh, divided by how much energy got transmitted. And we, so for the reflection, we need to know a parameter called acoustic impedance. Acoustic impedance is the velocity, seismic velocity in a layer multiplied by the density of the layer. That product gives you what what is called acoustic impedance or AI. In geophysics, they call it also AI. So a reflected part gonna be how much? Uh, I have two layers, let's say. Acoustic impedance uh, in here is lower than in here, it increased. So acoustic impedance in the bottom layer is larger. This is V V2, P2, where here I have V1, P1. In this instance, if this is larger, I get a positive value. I get a positive value. And the bottom never can be negative. The denominator can never get negative. So I receive a positive reflection coefficient. So if it's 
a positive value, it means the reflection is to the right. If it's negative, it means the reflection is to the left. That's a positive, this is a negative. That's how we can characterize uh, reflections or reflectors from interfaces, from a boundary between two different layers. That's a boundary. This is a different layer. That's a different layer. So in this layer, the acoustic impedance of the second layer, that layer is actually larger than the lower layer. That's the reason I get a negative. So if this is lower, so this value gonna be lower, this value gonna be larger, I get, I will get a negative acoustic or reflectivity series. Doctor? Naam. You mean larger in density or in the depth? Uh, larger in both uh, velocity as well as density. Uh, okay, density multiplied by velocity. Yes. Okay, okay thank uh, you. That parameter, that parameter will give us uh, the acoustic impedance. Mm. What's I'm getting in here? Oh, no, no way, that's fine. So this is how we characterize a reflection coefficients. What is the lower uh, value, the denominator? This is amount of energy originally hit the interface. This is the amount of energy hit the interface. And in contrary, we can also uh, quantify the transmission coefficient. It's easier to uh, quantify than the reflection coefficients. It's basically, it's always positive. Always positive. And uh, the numerator in this case is two times the acoustic impedance of the upper layer. The denominator is the same as with the case in a reflection coefficients. So the, the lower part gives you the transmission coefficients. So uh, based on the equation itself, if I ask you, what is the range of values you, you would expect with the reflection coefficients? What values range you can get? What's the minimum and the maximum value? From the equation itself, minimum is zero. No, it's maximum is one. So if the maximum is one, as one of you says, might I think, uh, if the maximum is one, so the minimum is minus one from the equation itself. If I swap these two, if I swap them, I get yeah, I uh, get minus one. Positive one or negative one means all the energy got reflected. Zero means no energy reflected. Whenever it's zero, it means that there is no interface. It's the same layer, basically. There is no change in contrast in, uh, in acoustic impedance between upper and the lower layer. It's basically the same layer. So how I can differentiate then between positive one or a negative one? Positive one means the energy refl got reflected, but uh, the, uh, the shape of the reflection was to the right in the seismic trace. In contrary, if it's negative one, it means the shape of the reflection is to the left. That's the basic idea. 
And again, there is a warning. It says that this is only as a concept or as equations, they are applicable only in the case of normal incidence. When the energy is hitting the interface in a normal angle. What I mean by normal angle, it means that the energy is hitting the interface at a 90 degree angle. These two equations, they are not applicable on oblique angles. However, uh, in this course, we will not go beyond the scope of normal incident angles. Then we will go to some equations. They call the, the, they call those equations the breast equations. They are much more complex equations. So let's quantify what is the resolution of data. How thick the layer should be so the seismic data I'm sending or the source I'm sending to the ground can resolve the thickness of a specific layer. Uh, based on our understanding of reflections we just described, let's assume that there is a layer sandwiched between first layer V1 and the second layer V3. So the layer we are interested on right now is V2. We are talking right now on comparative thicknesses. There is not direct numbers there on the graph. So what I get, I get two reflections. The energy, once it's getting reflected back to the surface from the interfaces, there are two reflections. One from this interface, the boundary between V1 and V2, and the other is between uh, the boundary between V2 and V3. So uh, let's assume this is the reflection from the lower boundary is one. That's how it goes. That's how it goes. Let me draw it here. And if I choose a different color, and this one is from the upper. So they are retaining back, so it already the traveled some distance so compared to the trailing energy from the second interface. Adam Qaddam al If I combine them, what the what the seismic uh, or the geophone record records is the combination of the two. What is the combination? Is the one I'm right now drawing with a different color. Let me choose uh, blue, for example. So the combination of these two is this one. So if I ask you, from this graph, the blue one, how many layers are there? You can simply say, oh, I'm seeing either two troughs or two peaks. You can say, oh, there are either two troughs or two peaks, or these two peaks, or this one is one. Let me delete few one. Uh, let me use, for example, this. There are. This is the one. That's another one. Within the blue line, that tells me there are two layers. What happens if I increase the thickness of the layers? I still can see two layers. I still almost can see two layers. At one point, there is only one peak and one trough. One peak, one trough. So you cannot see two distinctive troughs as the case with exactly these two. One, two. The first two panels or graphs, 
within them we can easily distinguish there are two layers but after some thickness those two layers are not resor resolvable there are only one layer basically and that's what we say seismic resolution how seismic data can resolve the layers and as a rule of thumb, we use this equation. The layer should be at least uh, one over four. One over four. One over four of lambda or lambda divided by four. What is lambda? The lambda is the dominant period of the signal I'm sending. It's the dominant fear period. But my, um, what I mean by dominant, it's uh, and it, the, the average uh, um, period. And we know that lambda in, in uh, signals tells us what wavelength lambda is wavelength and uh, there is um, an inverse relationship between wavelength and frequency so uh, if this is lower if the value is lower you cannot resolve the layer then if it gets lower than this ratio you cannot now uh, lambda over naam, no. is equal to what uh it gives you a number so let's assume that for example uh, my dominant i'm sending a signal having a certain frequency okay. and since it's a certain frequency it has also a lambda yes am i right yes assuming that the layer has a velocity yes, yes. Assuming that there is a velocity, basically, because originally you are sending time signals. Yes. They are in frequency domains. And you get the, lam the lambda or the wavelength in time domain. But you, you assume that I know the velocity. You multiply that time to with the velocity or divide it by velocity. Actually, multiply by the velocity to get the distance. Yes. Lam lambda. Wavelength. Yeah, wavelength in time domain. Uh, sorry, in uh, distance domain. And divided by four. So let's assume that my dominant period is 20. OK. If I divide 20 by four, what I get? It's five. Five. Five I get. If the layer is lower or its thickness is lower than five meter, it's not resolvable. You cannot see it. Okay, that means five and above, right? Should be five and above. Okay, thank you. So if you get it right now, Luareth, let me ask you a question. What I can do as a geophysicist to increase the signal ratio or to increase the resolution of the data? Not the signal to noise ratio, but increase the signal uh resolution maybe controlled by the wavelength by the wavelength yes how i can control the wavelength by the frequency yes how i can what can i do with the vibrator uh, i increase the vibrator the source high source yeah. high yeah. energy uh increase the vibrator uh sweep signal range, okay. sweep frequency range. Make it, for example, instead of stopping at 60, oh, make it stop at 100. Okay. So because we know that I need to increase the lambda, sorry, decrease the lambda. So if it's instead of 20, I can make it 10. If 10 over four is how much? Two point? Five. 
2.5. So the the uh, then the, the minimum resolvable thickness is 2.5 meter. How I can decrease how how I decrease this value lambda? I sent a broader range of frequencies. My frequency is larger. Minimum to maximum is larger. My dominant frequency then is higher. My frequency is higher. My dominant frequency is higher or the mean frequency from minimum to the largest is higher. And we know already the frequency and wavelength are opposite or reciprocal of each other. They have inverse relationship. The point again, uh, it was in some of the exams. How I can tell what is the um, minimum resolvable thickness? Uh, the figures in the lower panel they are exactly the same, but uh, let me switch off this one because myself I'm not uh, able to see uh, the slides properly. I'm not good in uh... oh well, let me see I think that's the one. yep, this is the one. Good. So uh, the lower panels basically are exactly the same. There is only one difference right now. So uh, initially V1 here, V1 was lower than V2, V2 was lower than V3. Here V1 and V3 are the same. So V2 is larger than V3. This velocity is larger. V2 is large, larger than V1 and V2. So what I will receive, I'm going from a higher velocity to a lower velocity. Higher velocity means higher acoustic impedance to a lower acoustic impedance, my signal gonna be reversed. It's gonna be reversed. So one of them is the reverse of the previous. That's the first one. This is the second one. You see right now they are not starting from the same side. This is the first, that's the second. Initially on the first panels, right now it's not the same because the signal from the LED, the deeper part is opposite than the upper part. The acoustic impedance is moving from high to low. And in such scenarios, the combination of the two, if I combine them, because the Jew phone records only the combined, it cannot distinguish from which uh, uh, interface the energy is coming. Does not know anything about the geology, the Jew phone itself. So this is the combination. In this specific case, I still can distinguish how many layers are there. That's one layer, that's another layer. Still, you can see here. But after some instance, it's not that clear. You can assume, oh, it could be just one layer. Just probably one layer. So we again revert back to this rule. What is my dominant wavelength? what frequencies or what signals I'm sending to the ground. And usually, uh, we, as we said, if uh, the, the signal does not change, it's good, but signal sometimes changes. It's always changed, by the way. And the earth, earth itself eats up high frequencies. 
they are sending high frequency ears keep eating up high frequency and that's the main reason you physicist cannot tell in high details the deeper part of the earth we can tell exactly in very detailed way the shallowest part of the earth shallow layers you can even use other techniques than you than seismic methods to uh, resolve the near surface geology of the earth in high detail but the deeper you go the higher the attenuation attenuation is a term we use as geophysicists to signify that the earth is eating the frequencies yeah it eats the frequencies how it eats the frequencies maybe the layers are not intact they are loose, so the energy got lost. It's the same way if you keep shaking your hands or wrapping your hands, you will feel some heat. The energy, once it uh, propagates down the earth, it, it's shaking the particles. Some part of the energy will be transmitted or transformed into heat which part of the energy will transform faster to heat is high frequencies than low frequencies. Concept is that even if you've spent very high frequencies, usually the ease eats up high frequencies. And what you get remained with low frequencies. And that's the reason, by the way, that whenever an earthquake hits a distance place, let's say Japan, for example, or some place in nearby Japan, our stations, seismic stations we have in Oman, sometimes they record those signals sent by the earthquake happened nearby Japan. And we record very low frequencies. We record frequencies below one hertz. Where the high frequency is gone, they couldn't arrive. They died during their travel. The earth eat them up. Good. Again, the same concepts. Uh, those are the same slides, by the way. Um, so how we can control the resolution? We might send higher frequencies. And also, we don't make our expectation too much. We can all say that, oh, we cannot resolve below six kilometers. We cannot tell in high detail or high confidence whether there is hydrocarbon below 10 kilometer. So if you want to go deeper, you lower your frequency. That frequency is lowered. Lower frequency, they can go deeper, yes. But they lack something. They lack the details we need. Low frequencies, yes, they go far the distances, but they does not provide us with high resolution information of the earth. And again, back, why we, we are not giving a detailed image of the deeper parts of the Earth is because Earth itself is eating up high frequency content. The same is the same principle is actually true with another geophysical technique called ground penetrating radar, similar to the antenna waves, Mojata radio, FM or AM amplitude modulated or frequency modulated uh, frequency uh, waves, but we are sending them to the earth. We send such waves to the earth and they can penetrate a depth of just maybe two, two meters, five meters. And in our departments, we have the GPR uh, tools. For example, in an, an, in an area like uh, in Al Khod, we have three antennas. One antenna is 100 Hertz, the other antenna is 100, sorry, not 100 hertz, 100 megahertz. 
The other one is 270 megahertz. I write them down here. So we have GPR in our department. We have three antennas. Each antenna transmit different frequency, central frequency or dominant frequency waves, not seismic waves. GPR is not sending seismic waves. It's actually sending electromagnetic waves. So we have uh, this one sending um, 100 megahertz and we have also 270. And we have finally uh, 400. Megahertz, megahertz. My question among those three, which goes deeper? Which image deeper part of the Earth? 100. Definitely 100. Yes, it's uh, a lower frequency than the remaining, but it has a lower resolution. Yeah, مثلا, for archaeological investigation, if you believe that, oh, ممكن في مقبرة قديمة تاريخية في المنطقة وبدال ما أجيب شيء ويضيع لي المكان خلينا بداية نستخدم طرق جيوفيزيائية نعرف هل في يعني مقابر قديمة وين أماكن المقابر بالضبط فنستخدم الجي بي آر وإذا تتوقع مثلا أن العمق اثنين متر ثلاثة متر فهذا مناسب جدا So I can, it gives you a centimeter resolution. And centimeter, centimeter, layer, layer, layer. Good centimeter, this one. Whether this one could give you if probably if uh, uh, every one meter or half meter, depending on the site itself. Whenever there are the moisture or water is larger, uh, the, the resolution decreases. I don't go cover GPR in this uh, in this chapter, but the principle is the same. The, the concept is the same. The higher frequencies, they attenuate faster. They cannot go deeper, but they give you high frequencies. Oh, sorry, high resolutions. Anyone is trying to uh, question me? Add on the soal. So let's move along. Let's discuss some uh, different topic. Since you are geologists, and uh, many of you also, or half of the students in my course, they are petroleum petroleum engineers. Here we have a seismic image or seismic section. This data were acquired on offshore. We have the sea column. That's the seabed. You see, uh, what is the strongest reflector in this section? Which reflector is the strongest reflector? Uh, who, who could answer? I received some answer through the chat, uh, but Ahmed is continuously answering. Let's open the door for others to contribute. What do you think? Which what could be uh, a strong reflector? Definitely see Abdullah, actually not Ahmed, Abdullah. Um, yeah, that's the seabed. Why seabed? Because the velocity or acoustic impedance contrast between the sea and the rocks is so large. And as you see, I'm going from low acoustic impedance, the velocity and the density parameters in the sea are lower than the, uh, the counterpart in the rock. I'm getting strong positive reflections. I'm getting strong re positive reflection. I'm, goals, I'm also getting these strong reflectors. Here there is one strong reflectors. That's an erosional surface. Right below, I see a different characteristics. 
I see strong reflectors. Those are called possible bright spots. It's a bright spot. It's a bright to the eye. The eye can easily catch it. That's the reason they call it a bright spot. Uh, those could happen whenever the acoustic impedance contrast between the layers is so high. And what seems to me that it's also stratigraphically contained. It's not ex extending indefinitely. It has a sharp edge. So it's stratigraphically contained. What that could be, it means that probably the lower part is water. Here it's gas. Because gas decreases the velocity and the density of the rock. If I replace water with gas, what happens to the acoustic impedance? It decreases. It decreases drastically. And what I observe, I observe then are strong reflector above and below the gas pocket. That could be a gas. That could be a hydrocarbon indicator. They call them also HDHI, direct hydrocarbon indicator. So that we saw one in here so you see this is direct hydrocarbon indicator here we have also direct hydrocarbon indicator those are bright spots so if you were recommended based on this seismic data without having any other knowledge where to drill those are two candidates locations to drill to drill here is one there is another one Here we have really uh, a nice direct direct hydrocarbon indicators. Those features, bright spots, they call them also dim spots. They are collectively called direct hydrocarbon can, uh, indicators. Here we have uh, also other types of direct direct hydrocarbon indicators with different types of settings. This is an anticline. Here we also have an anticline. Uh, that's really nice one. What I see, I see a structure like that. Let me draw it. Uh, maybe use a black color. That's the top of the reservoir. This is the top of the reservoir. That's the same reservoir I'm seeing it in here. And I see two features. One flat line. Here I see again this flat, the same flat line. The question here. Anas, what do you think? Anas al Ma'mari, what do you think is the flat line? Who can tell what's the flat line then if Anas is not answering? What could be the flat line? Summer. Summer, any idea? You are geophysicist. The flat line could be a, a fluid contact. It's a fluid contact. It's uh, the boundary between two different fluid fluid types. It either could be uh, oil gas, oil water contact, or water gas contact. So it's that's the contact, it's flat contact. Those are anticlines, and the closure is a could be a three D closure. Yani, مسكر التراب تسكر من كل الجهات 
Here I see again a different type of uh, structure. This is assisted by fault. Here is a long thrusting fault. You see it's offsetting all the layers from here up until here. There is a big offset. The, the, the layer I draw here is the same layer I'm drawing in here. Where oil could accumulate, they could accumulate along the fault if the fault is acting as a seal. And sometimes the fault can act as a seal. It's a sealing fault. So the hydrocarbon can accumulate in this region and I'm already seeing a flat spot, a flat line. And that's basically a hydrocarbon or a fluid contact. Again, it could be water oil contact, or they call it oil water contact, or oil gas contact, or gas water contact. Usually, uh, if it's a gas, it's going to be much more brighter. Here I see the same, fe uh, the same feature. There is the fault. This is the layer. Again, I'm seeing the same feature here. Finally, the same feature is seen in here. All of those are showing clean, nice, direct hydrocarbon indicators. Anybody has a question? Victor? Any questions so far? No. Should be flat or maybe it be a decline, like an, an decline? What do you mean could be flat? The contact? Line yes, the contact. Yes. What do you think? What do you think uh, usually the fluid will uh, look like? In flat. Yeah. Yes, the surface of the fluid should be flat. And the and the lines in, in here, uh, that mean the flat is the region between fluids. And the yes, anticline one is the, that structure only? The, the that's that the top of the, only? that's the top of the reservoir. Okay. Yeah, this is the top of the reservoir. Okay. The Thank rock you. above here, for example, the rock above here is a ceiling rock. Is could be, for example, shale, chert, igneous rocks could be also. Uh, but these are all sedimentary rocks. We see layering within them. In all those uh, scenarios, I'm all seeing only sedimentary rocks. I'm not seeing any igneous rocks. And your task, for example, if you are working as seismic interpreter, is to follow this horizon, to map all of this horizon. That's what you do. And it's not one line, actually multiple lines. It's many, if it's 3D, they are lines, such lines every, for example, 25 meters. And the whole area could be 10 kilometers in 10 kilometers. And your task is to map as a, uh, as a seismic interpreter to map the top of the reservoir to track on a computer like or a software like Petrel. Petrel is one of the nice softwares uh, geologists, geophysists, or even petroleum engineers use. You can use it to track the surface of the reservoir, believing that this is the reservoir, and find its whole uh, volume. And it can have a reservoir. Choose, uh, for when the spill point. Uh, you don't need to go into details, but from that you can calculate what they call GV, uh, uh, gross rock volume. GRV. What is the whole thickness of the reservoir? 
gross rock volume and you expect what could be the uh, the porosity what could be uh, um, shale, shale to um, or play zone and going to stop calculation making some calculation you give an expectation you tell oh we believe that there is that much hydrocarbon in this specific area there is a reservoir and our estimations tell us that there could be that much hydrocarbon someone might ask from where can i get the porosity sometimes from the seismic data itself you can estimate porosities you need also to know what is the water saturation you can give initially some guesses from where you bring those guesses from nearby fields from similar analog fields a field nearby or a field within the same sitting even far away from where you are studying the sitting the geology is the same the reservoir type is the same you can probably use the same variables what is the water saturation what is the porosity what is the net to gross what is the shale volume and those parameters and plug them into the soil calculation or volumetric calculation give a guess how much hydrocarbon is there what is the total amount of hydrocarbon and majority of the once they say yeah يقولوا ان عمان فيها كم نسبه بترول هذه الارقام غير دقيقه ممكن يكون اكبر بكثير عن اللي يتوقعوا مع الارقام هذه اللي موجوده من الاحصائيات بالعاده غير دقيقه they are not sure they just did some guessing to what we do right now We cannot tell exactly what's the porosity. We cannot tell exactly what is the water saturation. We just give some estimates. And the, for that reason, we never give one number. We give a range of numbers. We say, oh, what's the my base case? What's my the best case? Not base, best case. What's my low case? What are my lowest expectations in terms of how much hydrocarbon is there in the subsurface? The seismic play is really huge. Seismic reflection data specifically, they play huge role in determining where the hydrocarbon are and how much amount of hydrocarbon is there before going doing any drilling. You can tell even, as I said, what could be the porosity and there are thousands of studies done on the estimation of porosities from seismic velocities. And almost 70% of all the discoveries of reservoirs, they, were, they have been done through seismic data, more than so between 70 to 80%, especially on offshores. And most of them, even they were done without drilling a well. They look to the seismic, from the seismic, they guessed whether there could be hydrocarbon or not. And when you, you are, if you are very rich, you are having tens of millions, it's nothing for you to spend five, uh, five million, 10 millions, make 10 millions for seismic data acquisition, another 10 million to drill one or two wells and start your invest, uh, investment. You make a deal with a country, any country, for example, you, you, you say to the country, oh, I will take this area, I do discoveries, I pay you that much amount, whether I get or not, it's not your problem. You got already your, whether I get or well or not, that's not your problem. I give you already your money. Whatever then I get of money, I will produce it and the money goes back to me that's the system applied in europe in uh, australia in many parts of the world it's not the same system in oman oman has a share of for example here in our country oman has a share of 60 percent of pdu it's not totally owned by pdu but it has a huge share 
The same applies for other companies uh, operating in Oman, not PDU itself alone. So that's how the operations works. You might be lucky. There is hydrocarbon. You're going to be so rich. <laughs> So um, apart from that, uh, not talking about hydrocarbon fields, seismic studies could be used for hazard analysis. Uh, before going to the hazards, let me show you two different uh, seismic gathers. So here is one. That's a gather or seismic section produced from hammer. The source was a hammer. So the depth of investigation is until 50 meters. This is made the, the one to the left with was was made with mini Swiss profile. Mini Swiss is basically a weight drop. You raise a weight and release it with a high speed to the ground or high acceleration. Definitely the source uh, is much stronger than a hammer. And then you can go uh, investigate deeper sections. The section you see below, this is acquired by biprocises. You see here, it's going up to a depth of six kilometers or even deeper than that, seven kilometers. The interesting part in this uh, situation is that uh, there was a company operating here. There was a company operating here. They were producing oil, basically. You see, those are oils, wells. Mm -hmm. And you, you know that when we are producing oil from tight rocks, if the rock is very tight, its porosity is low, we can do some advanced studies. Could anybody tell me what kind of advanced studies we do with tight rocks? What operations we can do with tight rocks to enhance the production? Maybe fracture? Yes, maybe as I've done. We do frack the rock. We do cracking, an operation in which we uh, send high pressure material to the ground or pump material at high pressure to the ground uh, with the objective to create fractures. Structures could uh, elevate uh, the permeability of the rocks, uh, so hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon can easily flow. But there is a danger, and that happened in many parts of Europe, USA, and currently happening in a few parts of Oman as well, which is what you might activate old fault. You might what? activate an old fault. So they were injecting steam here or fracking the rock. And there was an old dormant fault, a fault that's dead. But since you are injecting steam or you are fracking the rock, you might lubricate the fault. That's happened in Ibal, in Qarn Alam, in also other parts of Oman. They are going through the process of either steam injection or fracking jobs in Oman. And uh, uh, fortunately, we haven't fall, we haven't felt those earthquakes uh, in in Muscat, but the people who are living there nearby they started feeling those earthquakes. And in some places. The surface of the earth experience sub some subsidence, depressions on the surface of the earth. Wind subsided. And during that process, subsidence process, some faults got reactivated. And as we know already, whenever there is a sudden movement, a sudden movement along a fault, it generates an earthquake. It happened in uh, in Holland recently, in 2016. People started experiencing earthquake of magnitude of five and six, 
and no one know why we started feeling the earthquake. And it happened in many parts of US, Oklahoma specifically, and other parts of USA. And recently we started feeling it also experiencing such phenomena in Oman. Um, so 3D seismic, uh, so all the sections or the data or the image you've seen so far were showing 2D. There could be a 3D, so uh, a 2D you can generate from a 3D by slicing, taking only one line. The advantage of 3D and you create a cube, a cube, a 3D cube of the subsurface. The earth itself is 3D, so I cannot basically represent it as a 2D. It's if you are acquiring 3D, 3D data, you are having high advantage. But the question is, shall I go right away for 3D? No. Acquire few 2D lines, investigate them. 2D acquisition is way much cheaper than 3D acquisition. So here you see the vessel. It's having so many stream aligns. You see those stream aligns? Five in each side. And those are the sources firing behind not one source, but an array of source. Again, the reason is to increase the signal to noise ratio. And those lines, they record, each one record a line of uh, um, geophones or hydrophones, line of acquisition. And thus you create a 3D volume of the earth. And it does not goes once, it goes like that, the ship of the vessel. To complete or the, to image all the area. Starts from up here going in a snaky pattern to create 3D. So, as I said, uh, if I, for example, in this image, if I map this one and if it's 3D, I map it totally, I can do what they call advanced kind of attributes surface slice. So I can tell the amplitudes along the surface of specific horizon, specific reflector. That reflector, I'm usually interested on in reservoir reflectors, so I map those ones and I, then I can do advanced analysis on them. So uh, what type of analysis they have made with this surface? Uh, amplitude instructions. Extracting the maximum amplitude or minimum amplitude or average amplitudes within that time window. And right away, what I see, what do you think are they? Who is a geologist? I need the help of a geologist to tell me what that could be. What am I seeing here? Any volunteers? If you see the shapes like this, for example, what do you think it will be? If you see, for example, a car. نزلت عينك تحت بتشوف مثلا آه بتعرف كيف الجيولوجيا وش تتوقع هذا يكون؟ It's an old channel system. It's wadi, meandering wadi system in this area. Fluvial system? You see that? It's a fluvial wadi system, yes. You see how interesting it is. The seismic directly give you such information. Fluvial systems are usually prol prolific system. They contain a lot of hydrocarbon. 
This is basically a surface map. This is a time slice. That one you see here, a time slice, not along specific horizon. With a, uh, it's just on specific time. Since it's a cube, a 3D, you can cut a slice in any direction. In this direction, another direction, or even horizontally. And we know what domain initially the seismic data are. They are in time domain. So the Y axis, the vertical axis is time. If you cut a line, take a slice horizontally, you are viewing the seismic data at a specific time. That's what we call a time section. This is a surface section. It's not taken along a specific time, but some interpreter mapped the surface of the, the, uh, the reservoir. From it, they produce some type of attributes or analysis. Some of those analysis could be what is the amplitude along amplitude is the reflection amplitude. Reflection coefficient, how strong is the reflection coefficient from that specific uh, surface? So I can take cross lines. Cross line is this line. For this because along. Parallel to the geophones, this is an inline. take a line along either cross line, int line, or any random line. That's a random line. It's not either Jufun along the Jufun line or source lines. You can even take a time slice. Um, this is not of, uh, you can delete these slides. We will not go into detail about seismic data or 3D seismic data acquisition. So I end up here. And uh, for the reading parts, I recommend you read uh, all of the books, especially these sections. Uh, sorry, uh, excluding these sections. Reading everything except those uh, sections. These are about sequence stratigraphy, seismic sequence stratigraphy. I don't think they are of uh, much importance to us at least in this course. So from 7.9 up to 7.12, they are speaking about seismic sequence stratigraphy, system tract, uh, high, how you can tell where does that uh, the geology got deposited from seismic data. What type of environment was that? Any questions? Uh, So let's meet again on Tuesday. On Tuesday, we're going to have a lab session. Goodbye, everybody. I uh, stopped the recording.